Hello and welcome to the Sibsey West Midlands Region CPD webinar on carbon steel tube advanced level details. Today's event will cover the development of issues with tube specifications, tube manufacturing and testing, examination of building services corrosion issues, examination of installation and commissioning issues, including case studies and digital data, the future supply chain challenges. Our speaker today is Dr. Chris Owen, who is Tata Steel UK's Customer Technical Services Manager, Building and Industrial Services Tube Products. He's also the Chair of the BMTFA, the British Metals, Tubes and Fittings Association Technical Committee, a member of the BSA, Building Engineering Services Association Affiliates Committee and Pipework Working Group. Chris proactively promotes the benefits of carbon steel pipework and product specification awareness within the building services and industrial services sectors. We thank Chris and all of the team at Tata Steel for their help and support in today's event. Just a few housekeeping tasks before we get started, if I may. Please keep your cameras and microphones switched off unless you'd like to ask a question. But bear in mind that this session is being recorded and will be made available on various social media platforms, including YouTube and our podcast, for people to catch up with afterwards. Alternatively, please use the chat function to ask any questions during the presentation. Please contact Chris directly for a copy of the presentation slides after the event, contact details to follow, and please get in touch by emailing cpd at sibsywm.org for CPD certificates stating your name, the subject of the event and the date, and they'll be e emailed to you afterwards. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you all for joining us for today's session, but also thank Chris and the team at Tata for sharing with us today. I'm really looking forward to hearing you. Chris, over to you. Okay, thank you. So today we want to cover the um, advanced section of the um, CPD, which we give out with regards to pipe work. Um, so again, just to build on a little bit more detail around the sort of tube selection, the technical specifications, and obviously, as uh, Josh has already highlighted about the installation and some of the challenges which we see when tubes are used in service. Um, just for those who may have not seen the previous um, CPD which we gave, which was more of a general overview, um, Tata Steel obviously heavily involved in the manufacturing of pipe work for a whole range of different applications. We manufacture quite a lot of different products which go into a whole range of different industries, but the part of the business I look after technically is what we call our sort of construction fit out, and that's where our building industrial services products sit. Um, we've been manufacturing products for, for many decades and they're used in a whole range of different applications. But typically when we talk about building services, what we have seen is a noticeable change in terms of the size range which is used. And that's really as a result of what we see in London with regards to tall buildings. So the little schematic which we've got here just demonstrates the reason why we're uh, heavily involved. When you have a look at the pipe work which is used in the buildings, particularly some of these toilet buildings, then obviously you can see there's quite a lot of meterage which is involved. We manufacture in the UK. Uh, we make our steel at Port Talbot in Wales. Um, we've been in the news an awful lot recently about some of the investments and the direction of travel in terms of the steel make, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, however, we have two manufacturing sites, um, one at Corby, one at Hartlepool, and these do range of different products to different technical specifications. The Corby size range typically goes up to what we call six inch 150 nominal bore. Then the larger sizes tend to be made at our manufacturing sites up at Hartlepool. We have two product brands in the UK market, the Install Plus and the Inline. And the reason why we have two products is the way the standards have developed over the years. Historically, the Red Tube, the building services product, only went up to six inch. With the buildings getting a lot bigger, the rises have increased in size and we tend to see people now use what's called API, which is a legacy standard. It's basically a larger diameter pipe work, a pressure pipe work to American Petroleum Institute spec. The reason why that's still referred to is because in the old days when the rises started to get bigger or people were looking for larger diameter pipe work, the British standard at the time didn't cover those sizes. At that moment in time, there was a lot of work which has been done in the North Sea. American specifications were obviously being done on those uh, oil rigs and pipeline systems. So that's where the API becomes more readily available. So you tend to sort of see people still making reference to those uh, legacy sort of specifications. So again, we have medium weight, heavy weight for this sort of um, 
BS1387 replacements, then the API sort of schedule 20, shed 40 walls. So we end up with a, a problem in the market where we have a, a mixture of different standards, uh, people still referring to old legacy standards. And, and again, you know, it's becoming more and more apparent that when we start looking at some of these project specifications, that the correct product information is not actually being listed. So it means it's open to interpretation and incorrect products may get used. Um, not to go into too much detail, but again, what we try to do when we highlight the brands of products which Tata manufactures is really focus on the specifications. I'll talk about the specifications in a little bit more detail as we go presentation pack, but really have highlighted the areas of, of interest here where we don't tend to have a single product standard now within building services because the standards are very poor and defining the technical delivery conditions. What we tend to do now is, is multi-specify and this allows us to have a clear definition of what the pipe work is in terms of its technical delivery conditions, the testing, the mechanical properties, but more importantly its suitability for particular applications and its compliance with legislation be it the construction products regulation or the pressure equipment directive. So as you can see here, I've highlighted the fact that we've got this sort of multi-certified approach for what we call our Install Plus. This product is rated up to and including 300 degrees C. And again, it is harmonized with the construction product regulation, which means we can see market or UKCA. But because it's going into pressure applications, we also have to make reference to European pressure standards, which are harmonized with the pressure equipment directive. Now, a lot of people in the UK may not understand the PED. Certainly when we've talked to consultants and we've tried to explain to them that the PD is very important, it's something which does need to be made aware of when you're looking at project specifications. And one of the biggest challenges you've got there is a lot of people don't realise that if you have a system which is pressurised above 0.5 bar, more than likely it falls into the PD. The exclusions are the size of the pipework, but if that pipework is connected to a larger riser, 200 nominal and above, then basically the PD applies um, and we see when we consult with um, specifiers and we look at building services specifications, this tends to get overlooked. So when we see people asking for 1387, then that's a problem because that's an old withdrawn standard. When they're asking for EN 10217, then that's OK, uh, but they need to define the correct part because a part one may not be covered under the PED. Part two is covered under the PED and also suitable for low and elbow to temperature uses. So, so again, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go into this in more detail. One of the good things about these standards is whilst they're a little bit poor in terms of the full technical delivery conditions and we have to multi-certify, they do have a restricted number of ODs and wall thicknesses. This makes it very convenient for people who are stuck in the tube and more importantly for the fittings on the market which get used with the tubes. I mentioned the um, the larger diameter pipe work. Um, so again, whilst that is referred to and makes reference to wall thicknesses as per the American specification API, because it's not a European standard, we still have to make reference to the European equivalents. And that's so that we can again tick the box with the PED and also we supply the um, the walls which are aligned with those European standards. So again, there's interchangeability for those products if they're sold in the UK or sold into, into Europe. One of the things to highlight about this product is that um, it tends to be manufactured from a much stronger grade of steel. And the benefit of doing that is that you can still have the thinner walls, um, which gives you a, a weight saving, a CO2 saving, but it allows you to maintain those pressure integrity requirements. And again, one of the things which um, we see going forward is more and more of these larger diameter pipe works being referred to in building services because of the fact that the buildings are getting bigger, the pipe works are getting um, larger as a result of that. And again, you know, whilst the um, standard which we manufacture to has lots more wall thicknesses and ODs, which are basically able to be um, produced, we do tend to see a lot of people specify or, or, or tend to focus more on what we call the sort of standard weight, the shed 20s to shed 40s. So again, having those defined wall thicknesses means that when you're jointing tubes together or looking at fittings, then you've got a lot, lot more sort of compatibility and then matching, which again is, is an advantage, particularly if these tubes are being welded together. So again, not to go into too much detail about the various range of applications, but I think what we want to try and really reinforces that, that there's a lot of different temperature and pressure requirements. Now we've done a lot of work as Tata with the trade associations, both BMTFA and BISA, 
we've worked together with a variety of pipework working groups to try and really start to drill into this and define what we call the sort of operating conditions. And this is able to allow us then to look at those different pressure and temperature requirements and then cross reference against the type of fittings or pipework specifications which exist to allow us to develop tools such as the um, BISA pipework selection tool or the BMTFA website tool, which allows people to then basically go in, search an application and it will tell you exactly what fitting and what standards are suitable for consideration. By identifying the actual temperature range and pressure range, it allows us then to start to go into some of the pipework get grades and technical delivery conditions, which technically can fall outside. And this has been quite relevant because there's been a lot of work, a lot of focus on what we call the sort of pipework specification and compliance. We've seen quite a few pieces of pipework um, legislation change, and that's become more and more um, evident post Grenfell when we've been looking, obviously making sure that the right products are being used for the right applications. One of the problems which we've now started to see in the UK market is, is a lack of understanding about these different product types. So, so again, pipe work may all look the same, but it can be supplied in a variety of different what we call technical delivery conditions. So that can be a cold form tube, a warm finish tube, a hot finish tube. Whilst this may not impact the physical appearance of the product, those products will be different as a result of the different manufacturing processes. And as I've already mentioned, some of the compliance has changed over the years, which means that those products are not suitable now for pressure or gas use or, or certain ele elevated temperature application. So as we start to become more and more post Grenfell of making sure that the right products are being specified and used on the right jobs, we're also aware in the current climate of a lot of people looking at trying to keep budgets down, the cost of living crisis, raw material prices have increased. So again, it's more important now that people, when they look at the cost options, that the cheapest option may be cheap for a reason and it may not actually comply with the specifications you want and it may not actually be suitable for the application you want to put it into. So we spend a lot of our time sort of educating and trying to basically make sure that people are aware that their projects are at risk if they don't specify the tubes correctly. And unfortunately, what we still see time and time again is we still see pe people making reference to old outdated technical specifications. And this is probably as a result of what we call the sort of cut and paste. So the copying from previous older projects, not realising that the standards, the legislation have changed. Therefore, they're carrying those old legacy projects cross into the new projects and of course that causes issues. We always see missing information in terms of the pipework specification. It's amazing how many people specify pipework without actually then saying what type of steel grade they need or what quality designation. Now quality designation is important because it defines what type of additional testing the product goes through and say again we'll talk about that as we go through the pack. We do see again conflicting requirements where people have asked for a particular tube standard but they want to use it in an application which has either the PED or high elevated temperature properties. So so again asking for a cold form tube for elevated temperature use under the PED doesn't happen now because the PED has changed, those tubes are no longer suitable. And, and again it's very important when we start talking about compliance and demonstrating fit for purpose that the right legislation is made reference to. So again People are asking for UKCA, people are asking for C marking, people are asking for harmonisation. So that's great, but if it's not in your project specification, then you may end up with a product which doesn't tick those boxes. So this was a, a very sort of simplistic slide which I gave on my first talk, which shows the sort of problems we have with the old legacy specifications being replaced by new standards. And within those new standards, you can see there's different manufacturing types. Those different manufacturing types will give you different products. So a welded tube can be made through a cold form route or hot finish route. Seamless tube is hot finish, but again, may be excluded under the PED, depending on what type of seamless tube it is. So the problem which we've got now is without clearly defining what you want, people can make interpretations. And the issue we've got now when you actually start looking at the standards, it's very important to make sure that you specify correctly because the pipe worth specification is really the confirmation of exactly what you've designed your system around or what you envisage you are going to get when you procure pipe work to be used within your system application. And this is very um, 
critical because when you start looking at the way the standards are set up, and this is an example of the pressure pipe standard part two, 10217, you can see that there's different grades in there. Now that's very important for us as a steel manufacturer, a pipework manufacturer, and also a supplier of pipework systems into the market, because this is like the ingredients. By specifying the type of grade you want, you can see the different chemistries which are required. So we make the steel accordingly. You can then see that there's different testing requirements as a as a function of the different um, types of grades and as you can start to sort of look across at the table five then this gives you elevated temperature criteria which needs to be satisfied so if you're just asking for a carbon steel tube then we don't really know what you want if you start asking for 10255 10217 then great we've got a better understanding but still without actually specifying the type of grade or the technical delivery conditions you still may be getting something which you hadn't actually planned for. And this is why, again, we tend to go into a lot of detail when we review project specifications to make sure that you know, they're clearly defining the, the steel grade, what we call the sort of designation, so the type of testing which that product goes through, and therefore the harmonization of type of test certs which is supplied. So this is something where we've spent a lot of time and effort with the trade associations developing these on line and app based pipework selection tools um, just to make sure that when you start looking at the pipework requirements that you are defining it correctly. So when you place an order through the procurement exercise, when you get material delivered to the site, then exactly as you planned it for. And it could be that you've gone for a higher grade of steel to allow you to go to thinner walls. So you haven't lost any service life or pressure integrity, but there's been a cost saving as a result of going to a thinner wall. There's a weight saving and by association, there's a CO2 embodied carbon saving as well. So what I want to do now is just go into a little bit more detail in terms of the um, manufacturing processes of the different carbon steel types. Um, because this is the advanced course, we, we tend to go into a little bit more detail about the testing and the, the production. Normally when we're running this course, we tend to prefer to do it at one of our tube sites so we can then also show the, the tube mill and show the, the testing firsthand. Uh, but obviously, you know, we'll, we'll go through the slides and if anybody's got any other questions or wants to see anything to do with this sort of manufacturing, then we've got some additional uh, resources which we can supply. So as we've mentioned, um, we're going to look initially at what we call welded tubes. Now, Tata Steel makes welded tubes. It doesn't make seamless tubes. It makes welded tubes and the welded tube is basically taking a coil and forming it into a tube profile. We have various different standards which are manufactured to, but what's noticeable is we have what's called traditional standards or thick wall tube. And then obviously there's what we call thin wall precision tubes as well. One of the things to um, highlight is when we talk about welded tube, there's no weld filler material as such. We, we actually take the material, we're superheating the three edges of the strip, we're squeezing them together to make the weld. The only product or the only tube type on the market which has filler weld in place is what we call SAW submerged arc welded. Now that's outside the scope of this um, presentation, but but you know again we 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 don't manufacture ourselves as tartar SAW tubes, but there's a company called Liberty and these mills are based up in Hartlepool. So there is SAW large diameter pipe work. And the reason why um, they use sort of filler material or SAW processes, because normally the, the size of these tubes, they're actually making the tubes out of feedstock, which is plate. So they're forming the plates either into, into two halves and then welding them together. Um, whereas we're able to do our, our tube manufacturing on the, what we call the sort of coil base, where we're basically taking the coil, we're manufacturing that coil ourselves at Port Talbot, we're putting it into our mill processes, we're forming it into this tube profile and we're using what's called a high frequency induction welder. So that's causing the free edges of the strip to superheat, we squeeze it together and that's what basically makes the weld seam. That is how you make a coal form tube and we vary the wall thicknesses of that coil to get the different wall thicknesses of coal form tube. What we do differently at Tata within our hot finish processes is we make a parent hollow and basically we'll put that through a furnace or a weld line annealing process and that removes that sort of stress, that area around what we call the heat infected zone. So when we make that weld, we end up changing the microstructure around that area as a result of the localised heat. And that is very important because that is a, an area of weakness, that heat affected zone is something which is a disruption in the microstructure. It can have different mechanical hardness. It can be more brittle. So when we tend to see um, 
material which has not had that heat affected zone and moved removed uh, effectively then obviously it can be more prone to splitting um, or cracking particularly during sort of um, additional manipulation so threading or, or grooving or, or bending and the image at the bottom on the uh, left hand side shows the heated vector zone and it's actually very visible we take a section of tube and polish it up you can clearly see the discoloration and that's the result of the change in the microstructure what we try to do through our hot finishing process is obviously remove that stress remove the the differences between the sort of localized area and the rest of the material and that allows us then to have products which is more um, manipulated um, without the risk of, of splitting or collapsing. So we can basically take the tubes, we can do flattening tests, just expansion tests, and, and the tubes won't, won't split because that area of weakness has been removed. I say we've got quite a lot of advantages and disadvantages um, which have been highlighted over the years. So all the advantages about heart, uh, again, you know, we, we can see that there are um, a huge number of, of benefits in, in using a hot uh, finished tube compared to a cold form tube. Uh, and again, the legislation has changed. So cold form tubes now typically TR1 grades, as we call them, are, are no longer suitable under the PD. And under the 10217 part one, they're only suitable for ambient temperature use. So shouldn't really be used for temperatures above 50 degrees C. Whereas a hot finish tube, that can be basically used up to um, much higher elevated temperatures. And again, if you refer back to the earlier tables where it showed the elevated temperature yield properties, then again, we're doing that validation testing to demonstrate that those products are suitable for the intended applications. Now, we don't make um, seamless tube, um, but obviously we still see seamless tube being specified. And, and most of the time that's because of legacy. In the old days, a seamless tube was always seen as a low risk option. The welding technology in the very old days, and we're talking sort of 40, 50, 60 years ago, wasn't as good as what it is today. So a seamed tube, um, a welded tube, there was a risk of it splitting if the quality wasn't there. Over the years, the um, the grade of the steels have become more refined, the welding technology has improved, and we've obviously now got to a situation where technically when we do the heat treatment process, we're removing that heat affected zone. We are removing the seam, but obviously a seamless tube refers to a, a billet making process. So from the image you can see, um, basically we take the billets of steel, they are heated up and then basically extruded or pierced. That then gives the, um, the seamless um, tube it's its name and then obviously as part of that tube production process then there will be additional heat treatment which takes place so so again a hot finished product and again very much like welded where there's a variety of different ways we can manufacture the tube seamless is the same so again the process may look the same but there's various different variations in terms of whether you're doing stretch reduction of that billet once it's been extruded and what sort of additional testing or, or validation is being taken place one of the things about um, seamless is uh, as a result of that extrusion process, we end up with um, ovality inconsistencies. So, so a seamless tube will always have um, slight ovality egg shape and in inconsistent walls as a result of that extrusion process. Um, this can impact what we call end matching where the tubes are, are brought together for welding. So again, you know, a, a welded tube because it's using a coil and it's more highly tolerant roll stands in its forming process, then you get very good end matching and very good length control compared to a seamless product. And again, when we start looking into the specifications in detail, you can see that um, if the steel testing is the same, the steel grades are the same, the steel numbers are the same. So there are interchangeable. Uh, however, we would say that because a, a seamless tube is being extruded, then the grain structure is preferentially aligned. So you don't suffer from creep as much. And that's why uh, a seamless tube can do up to 450 compared to the sort of 300, 400 for, for a welded tube. However, if you are wanting very high temperatures, very high pressures, then a seamless tube has the advantage that because it's being extruded, the piercing piece can be quite small. So you can end up with very, very thick walls. Uh, whereas on a coil based mill, we're restricted to about sort of 16 millimeters because if the wall gets too thick, we physically can't form it into that, that tube profile shape. So again, we've got lots of advantages and disadvantages over, over seamless. And, and again, I think we do see a lot of people refer to seamless as a, uh, a better product, but actually in building services, nine times out of 10, uh, a welded, hot finished welded tube can 
can easily be uh, seen as an alternative Bible alternative to um, Seamless. When we talk about welder tubes, I'm also going to um, just mention um, fin wall welder tubes. Now, these are what's called precision tubes. You might know them as sort of the um, um, mega press type or press fit type systems. Um, so these tubes can be used for, um, again, building services, but they tend to be crimped for joining. Um, we don't manufacture these tubes in the UK. Um, we actually do manufacture some of these tubes, our tube plants, which we have in Holland. Um, but I wanted to sort of talk about welded tube precision tubes because, of course, it's been a, a topic of conversation for, for, for many years in terms of their, their suitability for, for building services applications. So you can see from the schematic, the process is, is basically the same. We're taking a coil, we're forming it, um, but obviously this is still classified as a coal form process. What's happening is it's a continuous process and we're actually running straight into a, a Galby bath, which gives those tubes the very sort of shiny surface appearance, which perhaps maybe some of you have, have seen or are used to. So one of the things which um, we um, always highlight about the use of, of thin wall tubes working with traditional tubes is because they're both carbon steel, they're very compatible. However, the thin wall tubes do tend to have the heat affected zone still in place because they obviously have not removed that as part of the manufacturing process. It has um, suitability for um, service life applications because it's typically coated in galvanizing on the outside. So very good for sort of low temperature chilled water applications. However, on the inside of the tube, there could be a galvanized coating or there could be a, a, a sort of burnt in oil coating to provide corrosion protection. But obviously, depending on how you commission or process that material, um, you, you could damage that coating, which could leave it exposed to um, corrosion. And I'm going to talk a little bit about corrosion as, as we go through um, the the pack and the commissioning and installation challenges. But as you can see, one of the advantages of this product is it's very um, quick and easy to joint. Um, however, you have to remember that that joint has a last seal in place. Um, and also when we start to talk about jointing, uh, again, it's worth just pointing out that some of these faster, quicker, convenient ways of jointing may not actually give you the um, type of pressure integrity that perhaps you're um, looking for. So what we tend to see is sort of press fit, push fit type systems tend to have lower pressure integrity compared to welding the tubes together. But sometimes, obviously, it's not possible to do hot working on site. So we tend to see flange joints being used or groove couplings, compression fittings, and then your traditional screws and socketed. So again, you know, some of these fittings are actually using tube bodies. Um, so again, the precision tube can be used to make a tube or it can be actually be used to make the fittings which go on that tube. But what I wanted to try and highlight is when you're looking at the jointing technologies, just bear in mind, but obviously the pressure of the tube is only as good as the weakest link and nine times out of ten last weakest link is going to be the way the tubes are jointed so as you can see here from this um, schematic that you know as you move away from a welded joint you can see how the pressure um, drops off so again it's about really understanding when you're specifying your pipe work and you're looking at how to joint that pipe work then yes you can have some very clean and fast speed of work benefits from going to certain types of fitting systems but you might actually be then weakening your overall pipe work system as a result of having these, these lower um, pressure integrities at the joints rather than the rest of the tube. Now, um, we've been manufacturing um, both traditional thick wall and thin wall tube for many decades, but I'm aware in the UK market, the thin wall tube did get a bit of a bad reputation for corroding quite quickly. I'm going to talk about corrosion mechanisms over the next couple of slides, but I think it's worth highlighting the fact that we don't see the same sort of issues when our products are being used in the likes of Germany. It's all to do with the commissioning and the, um, the, the way the pipes are being used in UK market, which has left them more exposed to the likes of galvanic corrosion. Um, typically, they should be used for closed systems, but we've seen them being used in open systems, so oxygen has been involved, or there's been a closed system which has had a leak as a result of maybe a, a joint not being done effectively, and that's allowed oxygen to get into that system. Uh, as you can see here, um, there's some um, pictures which show how quickly um, corrosion can take place, and obviously the disadvantage of a precision tube is it's quite thin wall, so, so we see the corrosion take place quite quickly. However, if the system is maintained correctly and you haven't got the oxygen in there, the galvanic corrosion reaction, then these tubes can last for, for many years, many decades. But I wanted to sort of pick up on this because this was 
um, highlighting a, a number of, of corrosion mechanisms, um, particularly to do with pinhole corrosions, galvanic corrosions, um, mere crevice corrosions. We've sort of seen a whole range of different corrosions, um, case studies, which, which appeared as a result of these tubes being incorrectly installed. So again, going back to the, the the basics about the differences between the hot and cold tube, about the removal of this heat affected zone, this area of stress uh, around the, the weld seam. Um, so what we've basically been trying to educate people on is, is make sure that when they're selecting the right pipe work, not only are the right um, pipe work technical specifications being referred to, but actually understanding which is the right pipe work to be used whether it's a seamless tube or a welded tube, whether it's a cold or hot finish tube, and whether it's a traditional tube or thimble tube. All are suitable for most of the applications as long as they're installed correctly and you're aware of the environment which they're going to be uh, operating in. And really what we wanted to try and just touch on now in a little bit more detail as part of the advanced course is obviously you know, some of the issues associated with um, I say failure of pipe work, which is normally down to poor installation, um, corrosion issues or uh, as a result of um, problems during commissioning. So when we talk about the sort of pipe work design, we try to make sure that people are actually looking at how that pipe work is to be installed, looking at uh, whether as part of the commissioning process, if water is being put into that system and drained down, whether that, that water becomes uh, trapped or left behind, whether it then allows to stagnate and starts to break down to produce different types of corrosion mechanisms. We talk about the different types of corrosion types which, which exist, which may or may not be familiar to you. And obviously the use of inhibitors can extend service life, control of oxygen also extends service life. But again, it's about understanding sometimes that you know the wrong type of inhibitors could be used or inhibitors may not get circulated around the pipework system effectively. Or too much inhibitor uh, in a localised place might actually also be a challenge as well. So again, not to go into too much of the science, but the corrosion is, is pretty well understood and what we try to do is look at that what we call electrochemical reaction and we try to make sure that we're monitoring it and make sure that we've got the right sort of balance in terms of the carbon steel the oxygen we know that rust can take place corrosion products can can damage systems but really the main reason for corrosion is where we see sort of high oxygen levels the management of the water supply is quite poor so the ph or the contamination in that water may be an issue dissolved oxygen may be an issue in that water as well um, we also see in terms of the um, reaction of late, what we call the galvanic corrosion. I touched on that briefly, but we're going to go into a little bit more information in detail about that because we've got more information about galvanic corrosion now. So galvanic corrosion is really with dissimilar materials and, and it's become a problem now. We've seen what we call hybrid mixed metals. So we're seeing copper, carbon, stainless steel all being used in the same run. And that's causing these sort of imbalances in electrochemical reaction, which is obviously accelerating corrosion in certain products. It's not all doom and gloom, because obviously if you incorrectly install and maintain carbon steel tube can last, and we've got evidence of it lasting for, for many, many, many decades. Uh, it's about understanding exactly the type of, of corrosion which may take place as a result of you installing that tube. And when we talk about corrosion, again, I think it's safe to highlight that most of the corrosion, you're not talking about sort of uniform corrosion, you're talking about very localised pinhole type corrosion, which is about 70% of the failures which we are aware of. And this is important because normally when it's localised, it's down to something which is happening or something which is wrong in terms of the pipe work installation or something which has taken place as a result of something in that system. So again, when we talk about uniform corrosion, we would typically expect to see that on the sort of thin wall tubes uh, or you know, we do see it on the traditional tubes, but again, it's on the outside of the tube, normally as a result of, of insulation becoming quite wet. Um, to sort of the outside of the, the product being exposed to corrosion um, type environments. When we talk about failure, normally when we see a pipework system failed, it's very unlikely, but it's because inside the tube is completely uniformly dissolved, corroded away. It, it's normally because of these localised attacks which take place. And we'll talk about the different mechanisms, but as I say, one of the things which we've started to sort of see more and more people perhaps maybe become aware of is, is what we call this galvanic uh, corrosion reaction which is taking place. So, so we've seen examples of where stainless steel, copper and 
carbon steel being used in the same system. And the galvanic series is uh, quite well defined. So basically, if you look at how a tube protects itself, it will look at the different materials in that system. And then you have certain materials which are more prone to corrosion and they'll sacrifice themselves um, in an anodic way to protect the rest of the steel. And this is how a galvanized tube works. So galvanized tube is dipped in zinc. And you can see from the table here that the zinc sits uh, more towards the anode than the, um, the steel, which means that it protects itself by corroding um, and the steel is then protected as a result of that. So obviously with um, stainless steel being added into the system, um, then obviously what happens is that the stainless then obviously sits more towards the cathodic end. So it causes all these other materials such as the copper, the, the carbon steel and, and other materials to, to corrode a lot faster. Um, other considerations when you start looking at corrosion reaction of pipework systems is obviously the temperature, the pressure, the dissolved oxygen content, impurities in the water, uh, what inhibitors have been used, how effective they are, whether there's again a, a different systems or different materials connected to that run. Uh, and again, we, are, we, we can advise about uh, mitigating the risk of galvanic by selecting materials which are closer in that galvanic series. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the ideal solution is to give you something which is very resistant, very robust, but obviously trying to manufacture pipework out of platinum has got multiple problems. A, it being extremely expensive and B, as soon as you install the platinum tube, it probably gets stolen. Uh, so obviously we have to look at more realistic materials and you can see as you move more towards that anode to certain materials which are going to be more prone to corrosion. And the other thing is most people think that stainless steel doesn't corrode, but it does. And obviously, as we've just mentioned here, it causes other materials to corrode faster. But in the family of stainless steel, you have different grades. And again, they can have a galvanic reaction. So if you mix grades of stainless steel, again, you can be causing sort of corrosion issues within that uh, pipework. What we tend to see with stainless steel is this misconception that, that once you install stainless, it's fine. Now, that is typically OK if you install 100 percent stainless. And if you look at petrol processing or, or catering industries, it's all stainless. But in building services, that becomes very expensive. So we see stainless being used with other materials. And that's where this galvanic corrosion, this dissimilar material electrochemical reaction takes place. So stainless is, is actually seen as being a solution to corrosion but if it's installed in applications where it's mixed metal then actually it's contributing to the corrosion of other systems and we see fittings and valves and strainers start to fall over and people experiencing problems they never experienced before and we say we'll go back what's changed in your pipe work what is the split between the different materials now because if that's changed significantly then you've got a completely different electrochemical reaction which takes place another um um, type of um, corrosion reaction uh, is is crevice corrosion. So so again, galvanic corrosion is basically looking at dissimilar materials. What crevice corrosion is doing is it could be the same materials, but because you've got um, basically uh, areas where water or there is a um, a, a localized um, area where oxygen is depleted then you can end up with, with with crevice corrosion taking place and that can take place on flange places or it can take place actually within tube itself along sort of weld lines so so again you know crevice corrosion is is something which we don't tend to sort of see a lot of but is another mechanism which which does exist what we do tend to see is obviously what we call pitting corrosion and this can take place where we have basically um a, a change in geometry or something within the steel or a, a prone area within the pipework as a result of either mechanical damage or just something as a result of all the um, activities that go on within the pipework where a protective film breaks down or there's a, a localised um, change in, in, in geometry as a result of maybe some surface damage or what have you, which can actually then increase the localised energy, which causes the, 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 the sort of pitting and, and different types of, of pitting take place. And obviously, as we saw with the thin wall tube, if there is um, oxygen in place and the, the tube has been um, commissioned incorrectly and any protective internal coatings have been damaged, then obviously exposed weld lines with the heat affected zone um, present uh, become initiation points for, for corrosion. You can see these types of corrosion pitting mechanisms take place. However, there's, there's things which can be done in terms of mitigation to try and control and reduce that. And then erosion is something which, again, we, we've seen. I mean, erosion is not so much an electrochemical reaction, but obviously if you've got debris or, or corrosion taking place in a pipework system, 
then then that flow of material in that system, those debris, those particles can be washed along inside. And again, changes in geometry or changes in the um, pipework sizing, then that can obviously have areas where these particles are being basically sh almost like internal shot blasting, starting to thin out material. And as that material thins out, then obviously it becomes more prone to additional damage. And obviously as the wall thickness is reduced, then obviously pressure integrity concerns uh, get raised. And normally what you see is, is a failure take place. And when you go in and examine the steel, you can see actually what's happened has been not so much a corrosion mechanism, but corrosion elsewhere has resulted in debris. And that debris has then resulted in, in a thinning erosion of, of, of tube wall. So again, um, understanding the root causes of that then allows you to then put in place the um, appropriate mitigation practices. And uh, again, another mechanism which I um, will touch on, which people may have been aware of, is what they call MIC. It's microbiologically induced corrosion. So, so MIC takes place, and we saw this again on thin wall tube, but it takes place on thick wall tube. It takes place on, on a variety of different uh, materials, mainly carbon steel. So what happens is that if um, moisture or water is, is in the system and it's then basically left, then, then it becomes stagnant and uh, biofilms can produce. And normally we see this when pipework systems are cleaned or flushed as part of the commissioning process. And then it might be that the building is not being used. So they'll drain down and, and leave the pipework um, in a sort of like um, dormant state. But the problem is as you drain down, not all the water escapes, there'll still be moisture inside the tube and this water stagnates and breaks down, produces these biofilms, which then basically feed the sort of the mic corrosion underneath that. And again, very rapid pinhole corrosion can take place on, on, on types of tubes. So as again, it's about making sure that when you are um, flushing or commissioning that the right cleaning practices are taking place, that if water is being sort of drained down, that biocides are used in that to make sure that anything which is left behind doesn't contribute to sort of these types of uh, mic corrosion uh, reactions. And again, when we talk about commissioning, I mean, this is a, a sort of um, you know, it could be a, a CPD in its own right. That there's lots of different ways of of commissioning, lots of different methods and uh, methodologies which can be employed. Um, but what we obviously try to understand is, you know, what are people doing in terms of the pipework system. Have they specified the pipework correctly, and are they following a, a commissioning process which is not harmful for that pipework which they've asked for? And again, I won't go into too much detail, um, but there's lots of guidance and I put some information there about where you can go and get the resources. But you can see that um, you know, flushing out of debris, chemical treatment, um, following um, the sort of cleaning process, commissioning process with the use of inhibitors, um, use of biocides, all basically things which are, are, are being undertaken as part of a, a sort of um, sign off process and, and these can then help extend the uh, service life of, of pipework for, for many years if not decades. Uh, correctly maintained pipework systems and say we can last for, 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 for long periods of time without problems. What we tend to see when we get called out and we see um, quality issues or failures or concerns being raised tend to find that it's an imported product. Uh, we tend to find that uh, it hasn't been installed correctly. Um, some form of coating uh, which was applied to the tube has been damaged or removed as a result of the commissioning process. Um, too much oxygen's in there, the wrong pH. Uh, inhibitors haven't been used effectively and circulated through the whole pipework system. Closed systems have actually been open systems. Um, and, and again, you know, we, we look at the cleaning processes which which should be followed and whilst they may have been followed initially then if a building has been put into a dormant state and those systems have been drained down then obviously if the water hasn't been removed effectively or we've got um, dead legs or, or areas where the pipe work where water and debris can, can collect then we can see the formation of these biofilms and again as we've put um, put into um, you know, this early part of the pack about the different tube manufacturing processes. These will then obviously uh, produce different tubes of different standards, which will then obviously have different behaviours to these types of environments and conditions. So again, going back to the, the basics, it's why it's so important to make sure you specify the pipe work correctly, because if you're not specifying the right grade, and obviously stronger grades have better corrosion resistance, if you're not specifying the right tube manufacturing type and cold form tubes are more prone to corrosion than a hot finish tube. And if you're not specifying um, you know, how you're then basically installing and 
it's treating these these pipe works then you could already be doing damage to the pipe work even before you install it into the application and of course you want to install it it wants to be well maintained and you want to basically get many 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 years out of um out of that pipe work system um now I'm conscious of, of time. Um, we're trying to cover an awful lot in, in this session. Uh, I was going to basically cover uh, a lot more about sort of the physical testing, which we do in the products and as a result of product standards. However, I'm, I'm going to um, talk about sustainability instead. Um, there's been a lot of um, reference to Tata Steel in the in the, the, the UK press. Uh, lots of talk about Port Talbot government investment. I just want to explain a little bit more about what all that is and uh, the, the benefits that's going to bring us as a steel producer. We're seeing more and more people make reference to um, sustainable, so sort of reduced uh, embodied carbon, looking at uh, more environmental ways of, of producing pipe work, installing pipe work. So having the right pipe work specified is beneficial because we can use stronger grades, we can basically have thinner walls, we can take embodied carbon out. Um, but we also have some schemes which we've got uh, within Tata, which allows us to look at the embodied um, carbon and reduce that by up to 90%. Now, most of the discussions which have been going on in the news have been around sort of Port Talbot, around blast furnace steel making. So we say we make all the steel ourselves in the UK. Uh, raw materials are responsibly sourced globally and they're basically bought in. And those different materials are basically your ingredients to make the steel. And going back to the earlier slides about the standards and the different types of steel grades and the steel chemistries which ex exist, and we vary those contents to basically meet those steel requirements. Now, blast furnace uses an awful amount of energy and emits an awful lot of CO2. So over the uh, years, we've been looking at ways of how do we refine or how do we change our steel making process um, to basically make it more environmentally friendly. And Tata has been committed to be reducing its, its CO2. And we've been working very closely with the UK government to, to achieve that. And the reason why we need the UK government is we need to understand their energy strategy and their um, industrial strategy. Various options available in terms of, of the um, steel make. We can either use blast furnaces, but convert them over to hydrogen, which would allow us to reduce an awful amount of CO2, which they emit. The problem you've got is that um, hydrogen is not readily available in the UK market in the in the volumes which we need. And whilst you can make a lot of hydrogen, that requires an awful lot of energy and electricity. So so again, if you've not basically got the renewables in place to support that amount of, of hydrogen generation, then, then we end up basically switching to a, a, a technology which is in its infancy and, and won't be our requirements. So a lot of talk about the use of what's called electric arc furnace and the government has made an announcement that it's going to put something like 500 million into Port Talbot. Tata Steel is going to put over 700 million in so it's a 1.25 million pound investment to move to uh, electric arc furnace and the beauty of electric arc furnace is that um, it emits a very low amount of CO2 and more importantly the steel which we make from that is made from a higher content of scrap material. So in the UK, there's already a huge surplus of scrap. A lot of that is actually exported. So what we want to try and do is basically take that scrap, um, segregate it into the different types of steel grades which are needed to allow us to make our different steel grades going forward. At the moment, within the blast furnace, we only use about 17% recycled steel. That might see a very low number, but we are making the virgin steel. So that steel can be used time and time again, again and recycled. Um, if we put higher than 17% recycled in, then obviously with all the other materials going in there, we start to impact and dilute the steel chemistry. The beauty of an electric arc furnace is that by having the higher grades of steel to start off with, then we can almost have almost like 9900% of steel scrap recycled content, which then allows us to basically make the refined steel. The challenges which we have is obviously we need an awful amount of electricity, hence the reason for understanding the government's energy strategy, the use of renewables, and also we need to make sure that that scrap in the UK market is now segregated to so better environmental policies in the UK. There is still a lot of debate and discussions going on about the implications of moving to this um, because obviously um, electric arc furnaces don't need as much um, 
labor uh, to operate compared to a blast furnace so again there's obviously lots of conversations going on about what will the future footprint look like but certainly over the next sort of three to four years we'll be moving and transitioning to to the um the new way of, of steel making and that could basically allow us to reduce our, our embodied carbon by by almost 85 percent so it's a big it's a big game changer for us in terms of of steel making and then obviously by association the tube making um in the meantime, obviously, you know, we are investing in not just the um, Port Talbot, but all our downstream businesses, uh, all parts of the process are, are investing and looking at ways of, of decarbing. But, but the biggest, obviously, game changer is the announcement about moving to the electric arc. And obviously, what we want to try and obviously get across to people is, is this is a physical change of our manufacturing processes is not what we call offsetting where you know we, we've planted a couple of trees somewhere and say you know that's reduced our, our carbon footprint it's physically changing our, our manufacturing processes uh, to go from uh, an emitter to uh, to low carbon um, producing steel uh, and that um, is being bridged at the moment by what we call the insetting scheme so for all the investment which which is taking place now downstream or upstream we're actually able to take advantage of that investment and the carbon which is being reduced in our manufacturing processes is then being used for carbon credits to apply to certain products so until we get the um, electric arc on online we've got this optimus carbon light bridging scheme so as you can see tartar steel is reducing spending multi-million pounds worth of, of investment to reduce our co2 we have dmv who's a third party auditors come in and benchmarked our manufacturing process and obviously now as a result of reducing the amount of co2 we're able to get these carbon credits those carbon credits are now being applied to certain products which allows us to have this sort of 90 percent co2 reduction so we've talked a lot about how pipe pipe work tubes are manufactured and i think this is starting to bring that sort of journey to a close because we know we we make it with higher grades of steel more refined steel chemistries you don't have to have a thicker tube um, we can basically go to a thinner tube which has a um, weight saving um, there can be a, a noticeable co2 saving you don't lose service life or pressure integrity because stronger grades of steel are able to protect against corrosion have higher pressure integrity compared to a lower grade of steel most of the standards now which we manufacture to have multiple grades steel grades which are available that's why it's important that people specify those grades because if they're doing these types of calculations or looking at the weight savings cost savings or embodied carbon savings you have to specify the grade of steel you need and then obviously as a result of moving to the optimus or applying the optimus then we can take the 90 percent out now when i gave my um first um cpd we were just doing some um projects with with some end users in in london uh one of those projects has now basically taken place and been secured uh as an example of some of the savings so we were able to convert the um, imported seamless material which was thick wool to a uk manufactured welded thinner wool tube so instead of shed 40 it was shed 20 van itself saved over 180 tons of, of savings and co2 uh, and then we applied optimus to all the remaining pipe work which was being installed within that building so the total saving was actually over 500 tons of co2 and and that starts to get you know really impressive when you start looking at what one ton of, of co2 savings actually equivalent to you know the statistics are actually quite uh uh, impressive you know the amount of of energy which is saved or the amount of of impact um we've mitigated by by taking that co2 out as a result of our changing our, our manufacturing processes applying the optimus or being a little bit more smarter about the um the way that the tubes are, are specified um so again just to um summarize um an awful lot to try and cover within the um sort of 45 minutes worth of, of time um what we're trying to do was as tartar as be seen as basically trying to drive that that sort of sustainable agenda we know that carbon steel has been used for pipework systems for many many decades it can still be used and has a whole range of different features benefits yes there are obviously some installation challenges but if you install correctly monitor 
and understand some of the mechanisms which can impact the service life of carbon steel pipe work, then you know you can mitigate those risks. We see people using mixed metal systems, which is a problem because they're using stainless steel, thinking that it's corrosion resistant and actually it isn't or can cause more corrosion issues in the system. We do tend to talk to people a lot about galvanized series and it's quite surprising how a lot of people are not familiar with the galvanized reactions which take place in pipework systems. Again, installation practices, not commissioning correctly, not really understanding about which inhibitors to use or making sure the inhibitors are used correctly. Um, obviously, we've seen uh, a whole range of different sort of mechanisms in terms of corrosion mechanisms which can take place. These can all be mitigated and, and again, you know, testing of products the um, the correct um, specification of the product has been quite important. But what's driving that now? Initially, it was all to do with compliance. Compliance is still very important, but this opportunity now for sustainable solutions in, in building services is, is really where we start to see a lot more people asking about the specifications or what they can do in terms of pipework systems. Uh, and again, you know, an awful lot to sort of cover uh, in, in, in one CPD. So if anybody does have any additional questions or wants clarification or wants to look at technical specifications, then please contact us. We, our customer technical services team are, are, are on hand to support and, and help answer any questions. And, and really, I'd just like to thank you again for your time. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit more about sort of, you know, Tata, the products, the differences in tube manufacturing, um, the different issues which can impact tubes within the installations, service and performance challenges. Uh, again, I've covered these in, in some detail, but again, each of these areas quite easily can have their own uh, CPD once we start getting into the material science and testing methodologies, installation and commissioning, then then you know, there's, there's, it's quite a big subject, as, as you all know. So there's, there's lots to go at, but hopefully this just gives you a little bit more insight to some of the, um, the things which um, I feel are quite important when it's comes to uh, carbon steel and pipework systems. Uh, thank you. Uh, anybody got any questions? Whilst uh, everybody's just uh, gathering their thoughts, uh, just uh, just like to say yeah, that that was really interesting and informative. Thank you very much for that, Chris. Um, I, I really like the uh, section about how the the tubes, the coal form tubes are made from a roll of material and seeing the diagrams indicating the process of uh, sort of uh, bending it up, rolling it up to, to form the tubes, but also the section on the galvanic action as well. So, uh, uh, you know, dissimilar metals in, in a system and, and how they uh, interact with each other. Just while everybody's uh, formulating their uh, thoughts and, and uh, digesting that, uh, just a plug for some future events, if I may, before we get into any other questions. Um, tomorrow, we've got a Society of Public Health Engineers Insights into Sustainable Innovation event, uh, which is, I believe, a Teams event. Uh, so if you'd like to, to join that, uh, get, get over and, and uh, sorry, drop uh, Malcolm Atherton uh, an email. On uh, the 26th in Birmingham City Centre at Jacobs offices, we've got an event on hydrogen and the future of heating in the decarbonised gas grid. And then on the 7th of November, there's a barrier pipe for potable water supply and contaminated land, followed a week later on the 14th of November by reflections on the building regulations approved document O overheating uh, regulation as a way of working. And then on the 16th of November, there's a yen water treatment masterclass. Uh, you can sign up to attend and benefit via our Eventbrite page with details in the chat. There's a link there. Uh, and you can also catch up with our events by subscribing to our YouTube channel. And again, any feedback, thoughts and comments are welcomed by emailing feedback at sibzwm.org. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank everybody who's joined us for doing so today. It was great to have you with us. Thank you very much. And also thank Chris and the team at Tata, uh, along with uh, the team behind the scenes as well, uh, that have made today's event possible. Thank you all very much. Um, I look forward to meeting and welcoming you to a, at a future Sibsi West Midlands Region event in the near future. And I wish you all for the rest of the day. Uh, if anybody's got any other questions, please uh, unmute and or uh, turn on your camera. And uh, I'm sure hopefully Chris will uh, um, be pleased to uh, answer them. I can't see anything in the chat, Chris. And I think you've uh, given Must it have covered everything. Enough, <laughs> thought. Okay. So I guess we'll uh, say thank you all very much. Okay, thank you everybody.